Good evening. Welcome to the special lecture series on the Russia invasion of Ukraine. My name is Agnieszka. I'm a second year master's student in social design department at the Aca Design Academy Eindhoven. Urged by devastating events in Ukraine, me, together with Yone from Critical Inquiry Lab, Martinez from Contextual Design Department, and the Design Lecture Series, with help and contribution of many others, have initiated special lecture and events devoted to discussing the political, historical, and cultural circumstances of the current war in Ukraine and the region at large. The AE lecture, lecture series brings leading practitioners from the field of design, as well as practitioners from other disciplines, such as art, craft, curation, education, the humanities, and science. By bringing in diverse perspective, the goal is to create a space for critical debates and thinking about how our practice relate to current and ongoing societal discourses. These talks will span across three events during April and May. The lecture tonight is dedicated to Ukraine's politics and historical background and its relation to the region. For the second one, which will happen this Thursday, we invited Madina Tlostanova, who will address the issue of global coloniality, the imperial difference, and the trajectories of the former socialist East European nations. On February 24, 2022, Russia reached another stage of its colonial and imperial politics by starting a full-scale war in Ukraine. This war and its devastating consequences have affected many, from individuals to institutions and political conglomerates. For some, it has been a critical point to reassess, reassess one's creative endorsement and positioning, and moreover, relation to power structures, fragility, and complexity of how language, symbols, and narratives are created and used. Since we are touching on a sensitive topic, I would kindly ask everyone to be respectful and thoughtful to other uh, participants while contributing to the discussion. Also, feel free to have your cameras on, but please mute yourself until we start the Q&A session so you can pose a question. You can also write comment or question in the chat. Now, I would like to introduce our guest, Tadeusz Ivanski. He's a senior research fellow, head of the Department for Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldavia in the Center for European Studies in Warsaw specializing in Ukrainian internal and foreign policy. He graduated from Ukrainian philology and at the Center of East European at the University of Warsaw. He also studied at the University of Ivan Franco in Lviv, the school, school for Social Science, and at the Institute of History, both at the Polish Academy of Science. And now I would like to give the stage to him. Hello, good evening, good afternoon to all of you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that kind invitation. Um, I'm really glad to, to be with you. I regret that I could not come physically uh, to Eindhoven. Um, so this, uh, we can see the map of the Kievan Rus, this medieval empire that I was uh, talking about uh, the waterways were crucial at that time and uh, the waterways from the north to south from the Vikings to the Greeks uh, that is from the Scandinavia to the center of the world and that time that was the, the the Byzantium the Vikings they were not only plumbers they were also merchants uh, and Kiev, which was funded around the uh, fifth century, um, it was perfectly situated on the trade route to Byzantium. In the middle of ninth, ninth century, uh, the Vikings occupied that land, gradually mixing with the Slavic um, population, took over their language and customs. As a result, uh, of the contacts with the Byzantium, the Ruthenian prince Vladimir was baptized 
the ceremony took place in the old Greek colony in the Crimea, the, the Hersones. Uh, Vladimir became not only the Christian ruler, but by marrying with the emperor's uh, sister, he became the member of the Byzantine ruler's family. This dynasty, the so-called Rurikovich, they uh, ruled rules for centuries and expanded territorially. Vladimir's son, uh, called Yaroslav the Wise, was called the father-in-law of Europe. His, one of his daughters became the wife of King of Norway and then King of, De of Denmark, another the Queen of Hungary, and the third Anna, the Queen of France. Yaroslav's, the so-called Russian, uh, Russian truth, the Ruska Pravda, became the first written code of laws. It, rela it relaxed the strict pagan rules, uh, customary laws, and, and remained in force until the, until the 15th century. By the end of his reign, the borders of Kiev and Rus reached from the Black Sea um, on the south to the Baltic Sea on the north, and from Oka River, which is very deeply in the today's Russia to the east, to the Carpathian Mountains that are on the border uh, of today's Ukraine and, 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 uh, and Poland. He died in, 19, in, in 1054 and uh, divided his uh, state, giving the districts to the, to the sons. Soon, <clears throat> far, very far on the east, his, uh, one of his descendants, Yuri Dolgoruki, found a stronghold and called it Moscow. Constant battles between brothers and ancestors of Yaroslav lasted for more than 10, uh, for more than 100 years, but they were not um, to become the Rus' greatest danger and misfortune. An unknown enemy appeared on the step. That was the Mongols, the Tatars. The Mongols, they crushed Rus. The flourishing cities were reduced to ashes and never returned, have never returned to their former glory. Key fell in 1240, and with this, the symbolic center that united the state also fell. The sources, the source of Rus' spiritual culture was Byzantium, but in its political and social structure, it was part of the European world. The Tatar-Mongol invasion, it interrupted the coexistence of Eastern and Western influences in Rus, in the territories of current Ukraine, and set back its development in relation with other parts of, of Europe. Tatar occupation would last longest in the areas close to the so-called uh, Golden Horde uh, in the Northeast of Europe and Asia, in the territories that are now uh, part of, uh, of, Russian, of Russian Federation. Moscow though would inherit a structure of more autocratic rule and isolation from the West would not end until the time of Peter I, which is uh, the 18th century. In the South, the occupation of Tatars was shorter. Western influence would return there much sooner and its Western districts where Lviv is today, never lost such a context with the West. The totally opposed fates of the various parts of the Kievan Rus uh, will in future be one of the reasons for the emergence of different nations, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and the Russians. As soon as in mid 16th century, the territories of Kievan Rus are divided into three countries, 
The western and southern lands of the former Rus became part of another empire that emerged in the early modern era in the Central Europe, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. In the north, the Principality of Moscow developed to the future Russia. In the south, in the Crimea, the Crimean Khan, the remnants of the Tatars who had become vassals to the Ottoman Empire. I will try to show you another map now. Hopefully it will be, I will be successful in that. The map of Lithuanian um, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. With the change of the state subordination, um, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the ideals of the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment became uh, established in the Ukrainian territories that were called at that time the Rutinia. The Rutinian nobility, though Orthodox, Christian Orthodox, becomes part of the Polish political nation. Although, as uh, Igor Shevchenko, very famous scholar, professor at Harvard, who did that in Polish kontusz. The kontusz was the outer garment worn by Hungarian and uh, Polish-Lithuanian male nobility. But it must be also added that in the same Polish kontusz to Ukraine came the yoke of serfdom. And this serfdom, it provoked reaction. In the south of the Dnipro River, at the island of Hortica, the so-called Sich was established, the Republic of Cossacks. Three people, soldiers, fugitives, outlaws from different countries, different nationalities, and different and of different social origins, both peasants and nobles. The authorities of the Republic, this Cossack Republic, uh, including the Hetman, the commander, were elected by the old Cossacks Council. The Cossack phenomenon could only have arisen in the borderlands, where the um, uninhabited territories of the Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth passed to, into the territory of Crimean Khan. These were the famous uh, wild fields, the no man's land. It is, and it is from the borderland, um, Okraina in Slavonic languages, that the Ukrainian historian Ivan Lysak derived the name Ukraina. Ukraine. At the beginning of the 17th century, the people recognized the Cossacks as their defenders against the Tatar intrusions and the oppression of Polish magnates, Polish nobility. The Cossacks uh, Republic began to expand, to expand over bigger and bigger territories, and the form of Cossack rule spread over a wider area. And the name Ukraine began to supplant the name Ruthenia. The polonization of the Ruthenian elite meant that it was the Cossacks who uh, had to play the role played in the other countries by uh, the nobility. The Cossacks became the central figure in, um, in the national consciousness of the Ukrainians. It became the protoplast. The most important Cossack hero, the victorious hetman of the war with Poland and the creator of the state, the so-called hetmanate, 
was Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Until today, he is really widely commemorated in Ukraine. There are streets and squares in every city called by his name, and he is even featured in the five hryvnia banknote, which is the official Ukrainian currency, the hryvnia. Um, however, we have to remember that he was also a controversial figure, especially in the context of the war that it is between Ukraine and Russia now. Because it was Khmelnytsky who, in the mid uh, 17th century, in order to find, to find allies for the further war, war with Poland, surrendered the Cossack state to Russia. It was the Orthodox religion that decided the choice between Turkey and Russia. This dilemma of alliances, this uh, dramatic choice between two states and two nations, the Russians and the Poles, Russia and Poland, it accompanied the Ukrainians for many centuries until the collapse of the Soviet Union. The last attempt to break away from Russia was made by uh, Hetman Ivan Mazepa in the early 18th century, but it failed. As a result of Russian uh, repression, the Cossack state, uh, the Hetmanate, with rights of decreasing autonomy within Russia, survived until the end of 18th century. After the third partition of Poland, the Polish-Ukrainian, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was erased from the maps. Eastern Europe became dominated by the Russian Empire. But it is important that the very fact of the existence of the Cossack state became uh, the future for the Ukrainians, the fundament, the basis for thinking about the state and the nation. As a result of the partitions of Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, the, Ukrainians la the Ukrainian lands were divided into two state organisms. The larger part, the eastern, southern, and central, found themselves in the Russian Empire. The smaller western part in the Habsburg Austrian Empire. That was also the time of the French Revolution and the movements of Romanticism that was changing the thinking about the state and about the nation. They led to the emancipation of peasants as a part of the nation and to an increase um, of importance of the um, uh, culture and language for the nation's uh, identity. The 19th century in Ukrainian history was characterized by an uh, arduous process of self-discovery through ethnographic research, studies of folk culture and the Ukrainian language. It led to the first political actions aimed at achieving autonomy with, within both Russian and Austrian empires, based no longer on the privileges of the noblemen, but on the differences of, uh, in culture and tradition. The central figure of this period um, for the Ukrainians was the uh, romantic uh, poet uh, can you see the picture of uh, Taras Shevchenko. No? Yes, can you see. Thank you so much. Can you see the guy with the yes. Yes. mustache? Okay. <laughs> uh, so this guy with the big mustache, 
He is, uh, this is Taras Shevchenko, the most famous Ukrainian poet. Uh, as the Ukrainians say, Shevchenko, it is our everything. This is Father Taras, as they say. So Taras Shevchenko came from the family of Serbs. Since childhood, he liked drawing. His friends appreciated his talent and bought him out of serfdom. At the age of 24, as a free man, he entered the Academy of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg. He painted and created poetry. In uh, 1840, the collection of poetry, the so-called Kobzar, comes out. It is published. And Kobzar introduced Shevchenko to the group of the greatest romantic poets. He was writing mainly in Ukrainian by combining three different dialects he created his own language very natural and generally understandable in ukrainian territories it became the basis for today's ukrainian language but even more important probably was the political overtone of his work it was no longer just a a cry, a lament for the lost freedom and, and fame, but it was a vision of the future, the independent Ukraine. The poet praised those hetmans uh, who defended freedom against Poland and uh, against Russian Tsars. He praised Khmelnytsky as a brilliant rebel, but also accused him of his fatal alliance with Russia. He blamed the Russian rulers mainly for the enslavement of Ukraine. His slogan of both national and social liberation made him a prophet of the whole nation. This combination of um, socialism, in a way, with the, not, with the national cause became the main ideology of the Ukrainian movement at the turn of 19th and 20th century. And Shevchenko and the Cossacks became the central concept linking Ukrainians from both Russian Empire and Austrian Empire. The First World War accelerated the process of the processes of the processes of nation building nation building and made them even more radical this was the milestone on the path from peasants to nation but the process was not complete whereas before the war independent slogans were quite sporadic and ukrainians rather sought autonomy within both russian empire and the habsburg empire after the October Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution in, in Russia, an independent state was proclaimed, the so-called Ukrainian People's Republic. However, the potential of the Ukrainian lands was too great. The army was too weak. The elites were too divided. And the society was not consolidated enough to create a lasting, durable, state, the Ukrainian lands were divided again, because this state lasted only for um, three years. And uh, this time, Ukrainian lands were divided um, between the Soviet Union, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Romania. The Ukrainian People's Republic although it survived only three years, set the goal for future. In fact, it was an inefficient state, not fully formed, but sufficiently capable of defending itself and to impose on the Bolsheviks Russia the idea of being a separate entity from Russia. 
without uh, this political and military struggle of the Ukrainians and at that time, probably the Soviet Union would uh, not have become the federal state. On the last days of 1922, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, the USSR, was announced. In this form of the state, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, at least formally, gave Ukrainians rights they had not had since the times of Hetmanate, the Cossack state at the end of 18th century. The Ukrainians gained territory with strictly uh, defined borders. They own capital city, Kiev, and its own administrative apparatus. However, with the rise of um, with the rise to uh, with the rise to power of Joseph Stalin, the Ukrainian elites that were communist in form, of course, but more and more, let's say, national Ukrainian in 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 the content, in the self awareness. Um, these Ukrainian elites they were subjected to repressions in the nineteen thirties as a result of Stalin purges and Russification of culture, the national consciousness of the Ukrainians was broken and became Soviet. The second blow to the Ukrainian mainstay, the countryside, villages, was the forced collectivization of agriculture, which resulted in the Great Famine the so-called Holodomor. The rich peasants, the so-called Kulaks, were considered the class enemies. Those who rebelled were shot. Over 200,000 of the best farmers and their families were deported to Siberia and Central Asia. Some were sent to the camps. Um, the Soviet militia and army drove drove out of the villages not only the crops, not only all the crops, but also half of the seed grain to sell it abroad and finance the great industrialized plants. To this day, it remains one of the greatest tragedy in Ukrainian history. The Holodomor, the Great Famine. According to historians, estimate up to 5 million people died as a result of the famine um, artificially created by the Soviet authorities. Some historians and lawyers, um, Rafael, uh, Rafael Wenkin, Timothy Snyder, and Applebaum, claim that this was a punishment intended to break Ukrainian resistance to the USSR and thus a crime of genocide. The great transformation of the 30s gave Ukraine enormous industrial potential. It has benefited from it ever since. However, the price was very high. The loss of the cultural elites as a result of repressions, purges and deportations, and the loss of the peasantry as a result of collectivization and uh, the great famine. Society and the elites were pacified and deprived of those uh, who wanted to resist, deprived of the will to resist. In that period, in the interwar period, in the 30s, Ukrainian culture cultural and political life could only continue in Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. Political parties, cultural societies, banks, cooperatives um, were very active. Even, even so, this was not without the problems. Apart from Czechoslovakia, Poland and Romania, well, 
they were not the sample of uh, democratic states. The rights of national minorities, including the Ukrainians, were violated and the assimilation was sought. But the scale of this was incomparable to the, to the disaster that took place in, uh, in the USSR. I will now move to the second one. Um, the attempts of the Ukrainian nationalists to establish independent Ukraine with collaboration with, with Nazi Germany, it failed. Ukrainians fought in the armies of USSR, Poland, other allies, as well as in the army within the ranks of the Third Reich. Much of the military action during the Second World War took place on Ukrainian lands. Almost 700 towns and over 28,000 villages were destroyed. Some uh, and a half million civilians, uh, civilian casualties were suffered. Of the six million Ukrainians fighting in the ranks of the Soviet army, 25%, so 1.5 million, died. But not all of the consequences of the Second World War were so devastating for Ukraine. For propaganda purposes and to, the maintain, and to maintain the appearance of sovereignty, Stalin brought Ukraine into the United Nations, um, into United Nations with the status of the founding member. But most importantly, however, the territories that before the war had been the part of Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Romania now became part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. And in this way, the Ukrainian lands were united. I will try to show the map. Um, I will not analyze the Soviet period well, in, 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 in detail. I will just say that the Russification of public life continued the Ukrainian traditions and language were cultivated at home, mainly. On the wave of liberalization after the Stalin's death, the dissident movement emerged. Well, Soviet dissidents, that was a, a kind of a narrow, let's say, a group of intellectuals who criticized the, the, the Soviet rule. It was present in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, those were elites that had really uh, limited influence on the, on the people. State independence came to Ukraine from the outside. The Soviet Union, by the late 80s, was becoming an increasingly anachronistic and inefficient. The arms race exploited it economically, the war in Afghanistan in terms of military, and the Chernobyl power plant disaster undermined its um, social legitimacy. The collapse of the Soviet Union gave the enslaved nations a chance for independence. The Baltic republics were the leaders. The internal dynamics, however, of the collapse uh, was fueled by the power struggle within the, um, um, the Soviet Union. It was the struggle between Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the first uh, secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and Boris Yeltsin, who was the first secretary of the Communist Party, but in the Russian Republic. The Ukrainian communist nomenclatura stood by and watched carefully the course of events. It didn't want to leave the USSR quickly, and it didn't want at the very beginning to declare independence. It opted for a greater autonomy, but within the USSR. Uh, 
it used anti-communist sentiments um, to negotiate with Moscow the new Union Treaty and greater benefits for themselves rather to dissolve the USSR. Ukraine finally left the USSR only when it became clear that maintaining the state is impossible. And it took place after the so-called, uh, the, the fiasco of the so-called um, Yanayev Putsch, the Putsch of Yanayev, that took place in August 1991. Of course, there was a popular support for the decision to leave the USSR. But it is very important to understand that it was not the Ukrainian society that dissolved the USSR. And the independence uh, was not won. It was given. And uh, this had its consequences. And now I'm moving to the second part, uh, which is the 30 years or 25 years between the emergence of the uh, independent Ukraine and the first Russia aggression in 2014. So um, when Ukraine was established in 1991 with the Russian Federation next door, for the first time in history, the Ukrainian lands were united in one independent state. This state had to be built politically, bureaucratically, economically, but also in terms of culture and identity. Thanks to the influence of the intellectual elite from the Western, less Russified, less Sovietized, but also poorer part of the country, the historical symbols of the People's Republic of Ukraine, this republic that was established in 19. Uh, 18 and lasted only three years up to 1991. Um, these symbols were adopted the yellow and blue flag, as well as Ukrainian language as the only state language. Although the society was bilingual in Ukraine, was both Ukrainian and Russian speakers. Uh, the following generations were taught in Ukrainian at school and uh, official matters, like all this bureaucratic uh, stuff, had to be done also in Ukrainian language. At the same time, Russian language was very widely tolerated. There were Russian language schools, Russian was spoken in television, the Russian was spoken freely by the politicians, including in the parliament. I, I'm saying that to make clear that there was no aversion to Russia in the first decades of independent Ukraine. Russia was not regarded as a, um, well, someone could, could think that Russia was regarded as an eternal occupier. Uh, from whose rule Ukraine was finally liberated. That was not the case. That was not the common perception of the Ukrainians. Russia was a very important point of reference. Large part of society, um, as a result of economic difficulties, high inflation, high unemployment rate, in the first years of independence, was very critical to the collapse of the Soviet Union and was oriented towards strength, strengthening relations with Russia, the former center. The chase of Europe as a role model, and as we know Ukraine now, was by no means unambiguous. For the first two decades, public mood was divided 50-50. Half of the population favored uh, integration with the EU, half favored integration with Russia. This division was the main axis of political dispute in Ukraine basically until 2014. 
and um, it put aside many other much more important issues um, like economic reforms, the oligarchs in the uh, influence on politics, and the corruption. But Russia, seeking to strengthen its influence uh, in Ukraine, especially after Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000, uh, Vladimir Putin, who uh, never came to terms with, uh, with Ukraine's independence and regarded the breakup of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. Well, Putin failed to capitalize on, this, uh, on those posit positive sentiments. Uh, his successive actions were coercing rather than encouraging, blackmailing Ukraine rather than attracting. It has distanced Ukraine from Russia. Trade embargoes, gas cutoffs, interference in domestic politics, etc., have been effect effectively disgusting the Ukrainians with Russia, but still, the red line has not been crossed. The big portion of the Ukrainians believed in the civilizational, cultural attractiveness of Russia. At the same time of its foundation, the Ukrainian state um, was the continuation of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. On the one hand, it delayed the decommunization of the organizational and legal system, but on the other, it saved the country from having to, uh, to build up the state institutions from the scratch. The newly independent Ukraine has been USSR successor in every respect, from its status as a founding member of the United Nations through the administrative, legal, and economic institutions it created, right up to the formal continuity of the organs of power. The parliament of Ukraine, the Supreme Council, the so-called Berhovna Rada, uh, that was elected during the Soviet period, it lasted until the end of its term in 1994. The constitution, which replaced the Soviet document from um, 1978 was adopted only in 1996. For these reasons, among others, Ukraine did not um, develop after 1991 in the same way that, uh, that was followed by the countries of Central Europe like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Czechs and Slovaks, um, Hungary, or the Baltic states. Um, no radical economic uh, reforms were introduced. No decommunization was carried out. And no course toward uh, integration with the West was announced. Instead, a system of the so-called oligarchic democracy was created based on the rivalry of the regional economic clans. Oligarchs were capturing the state by seizing state-owned economic assets, industrial plants, energy production companies, etc. They were building political parties and uh, establishing uh, popular media outlets, especially TV channels, to lobby and defend their uh, economic and political interests. Corruption became a common and understandable modus operandi for almost everybody in Ukraine. The father and founder of that oligarchy democracy was the president, Mr. Leonid Kuchma who played the role 
of an arbiter that was setting, setting the rules and extracting benefits from the system. Kuchma has a very interesting uh, biography. Um, he, was called, um, he was called the Red Manager. Well, during Soviet times, he, he was the head of a huge um, strategically important um, industrial plant called Yuzhmash in Dnipropetrovsk in Ukraine. Um, that plan produced spacecraft and carrier rockets and was directly subordinated to Moscow. Not to Kiev, but directly to Moscow. He was, uh, we can say, 100% uh, pure Homo Sovieticus, an eminent member of the Soviet and communist uh, nomenclatura. In 1992, he became the prime minister of independent Ukraine, two years later, the president. And until now, the only president who served two full terms. Kuchma was born into a peasant family. His mother worked in the coal house. Um, his father was killed during the Second World War. So it was solely the Soviet Union that he owed uh, um, to his great social lift and, 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 um, and career. In 2003, um, Mr. Kuchma published a book entitled, Ukraine is not Russia. It took place at the end of his second term in office and 12 years after the emergence of the Soviet, of the independent Ukraine. What was the purpose of that? The book and its title um, were an expression of the change in social consciousness in Ukraine. It was uh, a need to mark its difference, its um, distinctiveness uh, from Russia both at the level of uh, personal emotions, group interests um, of the former communist nomenclatura, but also a very strong signal at the political level. It was one of the first voices on, on such a you know, high level within the framework of the so-called uh, uh, politics of memory that was emphasizing Ukrainian separateness and Ukraine independence. We have to remember two key factors distinguishing um, Ukrainian political system from the Russian one, but also Belarusian and Central Asian systems like in, like in Kazakhstan or Turkmenistan. The first one is the oligarchic system that I mentioned already that was kleptocratic, uh, kleptocratic corrupted, but it was and it is, at least it was before, before the war, uh, pluralistic. The struggle for power between the oligarchs was sometimes brutal, but nevertheless, it was real. Thus there was pluralism of views, programmatic pluralism of the political parties, and information pluralism in different media outlets, in different TV channels. This allowed for a real debate and real exchange of views. The phenomena that we did not, um, we have not been experiencing, we have not been witnessing, and we are not now in Russia. Russian kleptocratic system and oligarchy system is built uh, quite differently. There, are, there is no pluralism. It is only Putin and his oligarchs. Um, the second factor, unlike Russia, is that Ukrainian society has always been a political actor and has always allowed itself um, and has never allowed uh, him, uh, itself to be suppressed 
in the same way as the Russian society. The will of society has influenced political events. The so-called Maidans that you might have heard of, or revolutions on the streets of Ukraine, um, changed the course of, of, of political events. In 2004, the so-called Orange Revolution um, led to the third uh, round of the presidential elections in which Viktor Yushchenko, the pro-Western candidate, um, supported by the protesters, eventually won. In 2013, the so-called revolution of dignity made another president, also Viktor, but Yanukovych, to flee the country to Russia. That was the verdict of the nation because he stripped the Ukrainians from its dreams of integrating with the EU by not signing documents at the EU-Ukraine summit in Vilnius in 2013. <clears throat> the pro-Western revolution of dignity had disastrous follow-up for the Ukrainian state. It um, entailed not only the death toll of more than 100 protesters on the Kiev's uh, Maidan, but also Russia annexation of Crimea in February, <clears throat> in February 2014 and military aggression in the Donbass, which turned into local locally limited, but nevertheless, real war and regular war that effectively stripped Ukraine of the part of the territory in the east of the country. It was so-called the separatist uh, backed by Russia um, who shot down the flight MH, uh, um, MH17 in June 2014 killing almost 300 people and uh, almost 200 Dutchmen among them. <clears throat> Russia was the aggressive <clears throat> party in this war, but outside uh, Crimea, it failed to achieve its political goals, political goals in Ukraine. That was the full subordination of, uh, of the country and not letting Ukraine into the EU and NATO. Um, the annexation of Crimea, the war in the Donbass, and the fact of defragmentation of the Ukrainian state, um, it has only accelerated the uh, processes of separation from uh, Russia in Ukraine. The myth of Russia as a brother Slavic state united with Ukraine uh, by centuries of history, language, Orthodox religion, which was the main instrument of Russia's public diplomacy, explaining the many failures of the Ukrainian independence and arguing that Ukraine and Russia should be together again, it fell into pieces with that aggression. It ceased to be credible in the reality that Russia is invading, killing Ukrainians and taking territories. After 2014, the process of decommunization of the public space, Ukrainization of media and education system that gained new tempo. Russia was an aggressor, as an aggressor, has been losing public support as a civilizational center in favor to the West. Since that time, most Ukrainians started to associate um, the future of the country with NATO, <coughs> I'm sorry, and the EU. Negotiations with Moscow on the future of uh, Russia controlled uh, Republic, puppet republics in the Donbass that you can see on the map with the pink, with Luhansk and Donetsk and the east of the country. They were ineffective 
as uh, Ukraine was not ready to compromise on the expense of the sovereignty. Putin's plan failed. It seems that um, at that time he still had hopes uh, for the success when uh, President Zelensky took power. He was a, a non-politician president um, coming from um, russified uh, Ukraine's south, from Krivirich, the industrialized uh, 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 city. He was Russian speaker. Um, he was not. He, he he didn't have fluent command in in Ukraine. In, 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 in Ukraine and until he um, uh, won presidency. And, and, and Zelensky, uh, from the perception of, Put <clears throat> of Putin, um, uh, uh, was, was important because Zelensky did not take part in all these Maidans and revolutions, pro-Western re revolutions that took place in Ukraine. However, Putin missed again. <clears throat> it was the Ukrainian society that set clear red lines regarding the possible compromise with Russia on the belonging of the Crimea and the Donbass. And this red line was really clear. No, no concessions. And now we are uh, moving to the war that we have now. And this is the question, uh, what is this war really about? And what does it mean for the parties involved? Well, for Ukrainians, in my opinion, the issue is, um, is simple. This is a defensive war. They are fighting for their freedom. They are fighting for independence of the country. They are fighting for the territorial integrity. And they are fighting for the free choice of the model of, of, of the development. <clears throat> they don't want Russian occupation once again in the history. It seems that uh, the Ukrainians, they grew up to have independent state and to fight for it. This is why their motivation to defend the country is so strong. The morale is so high. There is a spirit on the ground to, to resist Russia. They have no place to retreat. Compromise on such a fundamental issues as independence, sovereignty, freedom, territorial integrity, it is out of the question. For Putin, uh, the issue seems to be uh, simple also, but perhaps a little bit more uh, complex. <clears throat> he doesn't uh, believe that Ukrainians are the nation that is separate from Russia. He believes, and we can see that from his speeches that he is delivering from time to time, from articles that he is writing. Um, he believes that an independent Ukraine is a mistake of history. It's a kind of a bastard child of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, what's more, he seems to believe that um, that Ukrainian state is not really independent. It is uh, a puppet of the West. NATO and the United States, which, well, first of all, the US are staging the so-called call of revolutions in Ukraine to overthrow the pro-Russian government. That was the case with Yanukovych. These actions, in his opinion, are in fact um, aimed against Russia. 
to weaken Russia. Therefore, what Russia has, has to do? Russia must defend itself against the aggression of the West. The field of this battle, at, at, the, same, at the same time, the target of Putin is Ukraine. Ukraine's uh, crucial importance uh, for Russia is, um, is determined by, 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 by a number of factors, including its uh, key geostrategic uh, position. Um, from Moscow's perspective, Ukraine is indispensable security buffer between Russia and NATO. Ukraine's demographic, demographic and economic potential has also led Russian Federation to make several unsuccessful attempts to include Ukraine into many different um, led by Russia uh, economic integrational um, uh, projects. Uh, these efforts have um, also been justified by the, the idea of the so-called Russian world, Ruski Mir, uh, which is the three-part Russian nation. White, small, and great Russians were meaning Belarusians, Ukrainians, and, and the real Russians, well, the big brother, the Russians. And last but not least, the Kremlin has perceived and continues to perceive uh, the potential success of Ukraine's transformation, uh, democratic transformation, free market-oriented tra transformation, um, and it's um, and Ukraine's uh, potential integration, political, economic, with the Western structures such as the EU and NATO, as a threat um, to the stability of the Putin's regime. Because when uh, once Putin wrote an article. When he said, uh, when, when he stated that the Russians and the Ukrainians are, the one, are, are one nation, basically. So the threat is about the situation that one part of that nation, the Ukrainians, are successful in transformation. Uh, that the Ukrainians are setting some kind of a, a role model of power change, like the streets revolutions, the Maidans. And this is what Putin doesn't want to have in, in Russia. He doesn't want to have the precedent that the protesters on the streets can change the power system. So this is what he is really um, um, afraid of, of the Ukrainian success, because that could be the role model for the Russians to overthrow, to change the regime in, in Russia. In the 30 years since the breakup um, of the USSR, Russia has taken um, a number of initiatives to keep Ukraine its, in its own sphere of influence, uh, as we discussed uh, above. But these have been forceful and counterproductive. Since all of them, failed, it seems that Putin was left with the last one, the military option. And when planning the military invasion, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, probably Putin most likely calculated in a way that um, the Ukrainian authorities are a week. They are holding the people hostages that the Ukrainian people, they don't agree with the pro-Western orientation of, in foreign policy by the Ukrainian government that the Ukrainian government was pursuing, has been pursuing. 
and basically that the Ukrainians love Russia. Therefore, there was the war was to be short, three, five days, and then the new pro-Russian puppet authorities uh, government would be accepted by the people. The West, in Russian perception, was weak and divided. France was awaiting presidential elections. President Macron would not have probably um, dared to react radically. Germany had a new social democratic government that would not die for Ukraine and with uh, de social democratic poli politicians uh, like Gerhard Schroeder and, and, and many others, President Putin had uh, good relations. President of the United States, Joe Biden, had growing internal problems and would not engage in Europe, especially as the with withdrawal from Afghanistan was uh, in a such uh, was a such a disarray. So it looked um, at the beginning of this year as a window of opportunity. However, these calculations um, turned out to be wrong. The Ukrainians had been resisting military, Russian military invasion for almost uh, two months now. They are defending themselves smartly and with determination. The authorities have not capitulated. Uh, and what's more, they remained in Kiev. The Russian army is advancing slowly. It was forced to withdraw from the north of Ukraine, uh, leaving behind hundreds of murdered civilians in Bucha, in Irpin, in Borodjanka. Etc. Probably you saw the footage from that area. In the West, the US and the EU have consolidated in aid to Ukraine and are imposing more and more uh, drastic economic sanctions on Russia. And finally, Zelensky became uh, a worldwide icon of freedom and Putin became an outlaw, a new Hitler, a putler, as the Ukrainians say. And finally, uh, uh, what this war uh, mean for us, the West? Or at least what it should be? I think it should be a chance to prove that the values on which uh, our countries and the EU rely on are not only the piece of paper, that they are uh, much more in, important than our every, everyday life that we, uh, that we have or we had, uh, that these values are um, um, defended by, they, they are shared by the Ukrainians and they are defended by Ukrainian soldiers in Kherson, in Kharkiv, and above all in Mariupol. Probably the last days of Mariupol we are witnessing. So our task is to help Ukraine because it shares the same values that we do and we should send them lethal weapons to um, resist Russia. We should send them financial aid to keep the budget flowing. Uh, we should write off debts of the Ukrainian state. We should impose sanctions on Russia and isolate it. Because if Ukraine loses, there will be other targets of Russia's aggression. The Baltic states, Poland, and ultimately uh, at the end, the EU and, and NATO, probably. And that will be um, the world that we know and value. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your lecture. Um, yeah, I think it's. Uh...
very strong ending. I would like to ask if uh, someone uh, has some question that they would like to ask. Um, Uh, yeah, if if no, or uh, maybe some some que question will appear uh, later. Uh, I I have a question about the Russian speakers in uh, Ukraine. Can you maybe talk a bit uh, more about um, the situation? Uh, how many of them identify as Russians? How many identify as Ukrainians? Well, this is a very good question because um, often the the, the, we are associating the, the language that is spoken within, uh, with the, the national identity. And this is definitely not the case in Ukraine. Um, because uh, we cannot say that every Russian speaker is in Ukraine, they are, uh, let's say, uh, they are not Ukrainians, they are not Ukrainian patriots, they are, well, pro-Russian in a way. This is, this, is, this is not the case. As I uh, try to uh, explain in, in the lecture that um, due to uh, centuries long uh, coexistence, um, uh, occupation, cooperation between the Ukrainians and, and the Russians. However, we have to remember that it has never been the situation that it was that the Ukrainians were dominant over the Russians. It has always been the, the <clears throat> mode. It was the, the Russians who were occupying the, 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 the Ukrainians. Uh, uh, the presence of, of, of Russian language is really, uh, is really huge in, in, uh, in Ukraine. And, uh, and that the Ukrainians, the majority of Ukrainians, they are bilingual. Uh, because uh, even though that uh, in 19, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the only state language, Ukrainian, was introduced and it was taught in schools and uh, all the you know, bureaucratic uh, work uh, had to be done in, 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 in Ukrainian, still uh, Russian was widely, widely spoken. That was also the, uh, the impact of the Russian mass culture. Like uh, until 2014, after the, the, uh, until the first aggression, uh, the TV channels, uh, in the TV channels, there was no quota, uh, language quota. We have one question uh, from the chat. I don't know if Sonia, you want to ask uh, it. Uh, I can also read it uh, for us. Uh, thank you for the lecture. One question, maybe the most difficult one. What could be the resolution of uh, this war? People in Ukraine, political analysts, are talking about the collapse of the Russia state, etc. Do you see this as a possibility? Well, I, I, I agree that the collapse of Russia would definitely solve this war. But on the other hand, I cannot see the scenario that Russia is collapsing. Because, uh, well, what we see is that, is, is that Ukraine is really determined to, to, to resist. It has some capabilities to resist. It has aid from, from the West to resist. And, well, hopefully it will have even more aid to, to resist. And on the other hand, um, Russia is also uh, fighting for, you know, when, 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 when you read uh, Russian outlets, when you hear Russian propaganda, this is also from their side, this is also a kind of an existential war. They are at war not only with Ukraine, they are at war with us, with NATO, with the US, with the, with the West. So it is existential Rus uh, war for, for the Russians. So they are also uh, not ready for concessions. So, uh, you know, it, now it, this, is, this is the question of time. 
It is about who outweighs whom. Who will be more uh, resilient? Is it Russia that is um, over sanctions? And is it Russia that, um, that is uh, experiencing bigger and bigger economic hardship? And it will be experiencing uh, this hardship in the course of implementing sanctions and, and how the sanction, and the results of the sanctions. Um, or is it Ukraine uh, who has limited reserves, limited potential, but has great morale, great spirit, and uh, it has uh, uh, the aid from from the West. So both sides are not ready for concessions. I would say that Ukraine is ready to compromise. It's not ready for concessions. It's ready for compromise. Russia is not ready uh, either for compromise nor for concessions. So yeah, I think this war can last a few more months. Uh, not to say years, we don't know what is the outcome, what could be the outcome of that war. This war can be pro protracted because we see Russia, it has problems, military problems. So we can, well, we can, we can draw the scenario that, um, that there will be a pause. Um, this war will be suspended for quite a time. Russia will not withdraw its forces from, uh, the from the territories already grabbed in the Donbass, in the southern part of Ukraine, like Kherson, Zaporizhia, Mariupol. But it might be ready for a, for a pause, for a suspension, to reinvigorate for one, two, three years, and to then to start again. So the resolution, the final resolution of this war, it is, as you, as you said, this is the defragmentation. This is the, the end of Russia as we know. This is the end of Russian Federation as we know. I think only then, if there is a situation of Russian revolution, the Russians come out to the streets and they are trying to change the change power over from Putin. But we we don't see well. I don't see uh, I saw, I don't see that happening, and I'm not expecting that it can happen because the Russians are not the Ukrainians. The Russians are not the political actor as the Ukrainians are. So. Uh, Another option is the coup in Moscow. A lot of people wake up every day and check the smartphones if, if Putin is still alive. But uh, we also, well, I don't see uh, any uh, signs of that and the scratches on, on this uh, power vertical in, in, uh, in Russia. So, yeah, well, I, I agree that the only way to, for the final resolution of this war is the collapse of Russia, but we don't see signs of Russia collapsing. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's difficult uh, to, to predict. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have I think time for one more question. So uh, if someone uh, wants to share, please uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and if no, maybe the, the last question from us, uh, I think it was um, partly covered in, in the presentation, but uh, Maybe we can elaborate on it a little bit more. Um, 
I think in, in the, the West leftist discourse, we often hear about the NATO expansion to the East that really pushed Russia aggression. And can you, can you maybe um, uh, explain how you, how you see this, this notion? Um, I think this, this, this notion that there is kind of a Russia, the, a NATO ex expansion that it very well fits into Russian narrative. That there is a kind of a NATO as an organization that is moving closer to, to Russian borders and it is aggressive it is to, uh, um, to conquer Russia, to, to endanger Russia's independence. Like this is, this is, this is uh, I think uh, it very well fits into Russian propaganda. And I think this is not true because we have to remember that, um, that the fact that NATO expanded, it is based on the individual individual choices of every single uh, state that once in the 90s, well, I mean about Poland and the Czech Republic and Slovaks and, and Hungarians and, and the Baltic states, that they once they decided that they want to pursue that goal, that they want to join NATO because they are these countries, they were and they are uh, afraid of Russian imperialism, of Russian aggressive politics. And it proved right, because we saw Georgia in 2008. Uh, before that, we saw Chechnya two times, 1993. Um, and then the second Chechen war, we saw uh, 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 Georgia 2008. We saw first Ukrainian war 2014, and now we see the full scale invasion. So it proved wrong. Uh, it, it proved right to get into NATO. And to, uh, uh, so this is, this is uh, but we have to remember that NATO itself, it is not as the Russians uh, are stating, and as, as Putin is, uh, 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 is describing that, it is not that, that NATO, it is not an offensive alliance that is going to conquer someone that was and from the very beginning it was the defensive alliance because it was created during the cold war and it was to defend all of its members um, um, from russia so i would say that this is a fact that nato is getting bigger and bigger but this is not the case that it is uh, getting closer and closer to Russia to somehow uh, put Russia's existence at risk and to endanger Russia. This is this is not true. But this is but this is this is uh, Russia's narrative. This is Russia's perception, which is we have to remember that. Who is ruling Russia? The, the ruling elite in Russia it derives from the KGB, from 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 the secret service, with and and those people are thinking in the in that let's say uh, um, military way. They 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 think about uh, security all the time, not about coexistence. They they think in a Darwinian let's say paradigm that 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 there is a that there is not that that existence of the state it is not about cooperation this is about the rivalry so um, yeah i think yes this is true that nato is bigger and bigger but it is not definitely not true that it poses some threat existential threat to, to russia Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your answer, for the lecture, and thank you everyone for the participation. Thank you so much. I think it was very insightful and uh, we are happy. As I mentioned before, we invite you also on uh, 
Thursday, uh, same hour, 7 p.m. Uh, for for the second lecture from the series. And yeah, uh, we wish you all good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really a pleasure.